I've always been really interested in these giant battery power stations. They're kind of like just massive versions of your mobile phone battery bank. But they've got a couple of key differences. And the first is that they've got these sine wave inverters built in, which lets them output AC power, the same as you get in your house. So you get these proper AC sockets. You obviously buy the one that uses the same household sockets as whichever country you're in. And there's a bit of an issue in that the industry often refers to these as generators. And I think that really confuses everybody and it sort of annoys the people that do know that they're not generators. Uh, they are just giant batteries you have to charge them with some sort of energy source first but that's not to say they're not really useful things and they've got a couple of particularly interesting use cases which we're going to look at in this video the other big difference between this kind of battery bank and the smaller mobile phone ones is that these power station type ones use LFP batteries and that's always been particularly interesting to me so an LFP battery actually has lower energy density than the normal batteries that you get inside your battery banks and your mobile phones and most of our lithium-ion kind of smaller devices where energy density per weight is the main goal so according to Wikipedia, LFP batteries also don't have cobalt or nickel in them. Another interesting difference with an LFP battery is they're capable of many more charge cycles than normal lithium ion batteries. They're often cited as being capable of about 3000 charge cycles, which is a good deal more than we expect out of the normal NMC lithium ion batteries. They're also more stable and less prone to fires. So it's actually a really interesting battery technology once you remove the sort of requirement for absolute energy density. If you're up to speed with your electric cars, you'll know that some electric cars use LFP batteries as the, as the battery in the car, and some use the NMC type batteries. So my Tesla actually uses an NMC battery, but the lower range Tesla uses an LFP battery. And one of the differences between those two cars is in the software interface, Tesla actually suggests charging to 100% and, and has just actually removed the limit Limit, um, that I have in mind that lets you limit the battery charge to 80% each time. So there really is this idea with an LFP battery that it's okay and even encouraged to charge it up to 100% and that isn't the case with NMC batteries. Tesla sort of give you this option and recommendation to limit the charge to around 80% for your normal day-to-day -day driving. So it's clear that with an LFP battery it's okay to charge it to 100%. What I'm not quite as clear on though is if it's okay to leave it at 100% because we know with NMC batteries it's definitely a no-go to leave them at that full state of charge for any length of time. There doesn't seem to be any recommendation to avoid leaving it at 100% state of charge in the manual for this device, so it's still slightly unclear as to whether you could just charge it to 100% full and then just leave it in that state waiting for an emergency situation where you would want to use it, or if it might actually just be that because this battery has an inherently greater number of charge cycles, we're sort of using that capacity, we're getting away with leaving it at 100% state of charge if we wanted to do that, purely because it has that greater capacity for charge cycles. It seems a little bit harder to get hold of that information. One thing it does say in the manual is that if you are going to leave it for a long time, it says to have it at a minimum of 80%, but it doesn't mention any kind of maximum. So I think for me, I'm just going to leave it as close to 100% as I can, because if I have a power cut, I want to know that it's, it's got the energy in there. And it's the LFP battery that makes that kind of use case seem much more appropriate for this kind of product. Essentially, if you were to have a normal lithium ion NMC type battery and charge it to 100% and then just leave it at that state of charge, it's pretty widely documented that that's a really fast way of destroying those batteries. But there are three areas I'm mainly concerned with in a power cut situation. Obviously the first is central heating. So we've got gas central heating, but the boiler still requires electricity to run the pump and obviously the controller and the, the panel and all the rest of it. Apparently the pumps for central heating use about 60 watts when they're running. Obviously when the boiler isn't actually running then the power will drop much more just down to what's needed for the control panel. The main issue of course is that the boiler itself doesn't have a normal plug. It's actually hardwired in. So it would need to be a pretty serious emergency type power cut situation where I was fairly confident we wouldn't get power restored for a reasonable amount of time and we really wanted that heater back on. I'd have to take the wire out of the built-in switch here and put a plug on it so that I could plug it into this battery device. But it would be possible and we'd have central heating back online so that'd be pretty cool. And it would be able to run this at least for a couple of days if that 60 watt pump was just sort of cycling on and off throughout the day. This battery's got about 1400 watt hours of capacity so if it was 100 watts it would run for 14 hours, 50 watts it would run for 28 hours and so on. So I think we'd probably get a good couple of days out of this powering the pump for the boiler if it's clicking on and off throughout the day. I mean it's hard to know exactly how much power it uses but if it's 60 watts when it's on and it's on say half the time in winter maybe then obviously looking at about 30 watt load. So it could run that for about two days 
things. We're obviously sort of fairly ballpark figures here, but it's interesting to get a rough idea. And obviously, in an emergency situation, you'd be a lot more frugal with your energy as well. So it's got the capacity to, in an emergency situation, really stretch things out. The other thing that annoys me about power cuts is the internet going down. You know, there's no real reason that the internet should go down just because you've got a power cut. Your phone line is still connected. So we could connect our broadband modem and Wi-Fi to this unit in that situation, and we'd still have internet. And of course, both of those devices are pretty low in energy consumption as well. So again, we'd get a good long runtime out of those devices. The third thing, of course, that you might be quite keen to keep going in a power cut situation is your fridge. If you've got perishable stuff in your freezer that you don't want to obviously waste um, running your fridge freezer. And the interesting thing about a fridge freezer going to a backup battery system is, of course, because it's in its cold state when the power goes off, you haven't got to have that initial period where the fridge freezer uses a lot of energy. You're just in that maintenance state and that uses a lot less power. Obviously, you could make quite sensible decisions in this kind of a situation to maximize the runtime. But essentially, with the boiler, the fridge and the router and modem connected to this, we know we'd be we'd be pretty confident that if we're making sensible choices, we've got a good minimum 24 hour backup zone, which I think is pretty cool. I was actually quite interested in exploring how this thing could be used and if it could be used to replace a UPS system. So in my office here, I have the Mac connected to a UPS backup because it's a Mac studio. It doesn't have its own battery inside. I didn't want that thing just cutting out uh, if we have a power cut situation. So it's connected to this UPS and that's an uninterruptible power supply. So if we have a power cut, that thing immediately switches over to its own internal battery and gives me a few minutes at most to shut down my Mac safely and eject the hard drives and all of that. So that's kind of a, the role of a UPS is to do that live switch over. So it's connected to the mains power all the time and actually just switches over to its own inverter as soon as you have a power cut and it will give you that energy just as a sort of safe window to close everything down. So I thought actually if this thing could run in that way, so you leave it plugged in, you leave your devices connected to it. And of course, as soon as the power goes, it stops charging itself and it will just carry on powering your devices. But annoyingly, it does seem that it's not actually a recommended way of using this device. As I mentioned earlier, that email exchange I had with them, they did suggest that it wasn't sensible to leave this thing charging all of the time. So that does seem like it's not really a recommended use case for this device, but it was quite interesting to explore if it could be used like that. I think it's sensible to still use a UPS for your computer and then you have this battery backup for a more flexible approach to dealing with a, a long-term power cut situation. Of course, another main use case for a device like this is, is sort of camping or glamping and, and other off-grid recreational uses. And that's where the solar panel starts to make a lot of sense as well. So this thing can be charged from one or two connected solar panels. These are 100 watt panels, and so obviously if you're connecting two, so you can charge it at theoretically 200 watts. Uh, now, from my testing with the single panel, I didn't ever hit 100 watts, even in the middle of a sunny day. The peak power really is only the concentrated hours in the, in the center of the day around noontime. So I saw over 80 watts for a reasonable portion of the day. If it's cloudier in the morning or the afternoon, you are looking at only 20 watts here or there. So you have to be realistic about how much power you're going to expect to put back into this battery over the course of a day, or of course, what time of year it is. But then the flip side of that is, if this is a recreational situation, the likelihood is is we're camping in the summer rather than the winter. So the likelihood of more good sunshine hours in the day is obviously higher in this situation as well. It's actually a really useful device for more long-term off-grid arrangements as well. Now, my wife and I actually lived off-grid for a year. We lived on a narrowboat. Uh, so we, we have kind of lived through this process of dealing with electricity requirements when you're off-grid. Uh, it's definitely quite a challenge. We used to have a little Honda petrol generator. I think it was two kilowatt generator. We'd use that to charge the batteries in the boat and obviously give us AC power through the boat when it was running as well. But a device like this that could be accumulating energy from two solar panels on the roof um, and allowing you to sort of even that out and bring some power into the evenings as well would have been really a really very useful device to have in that situation. Interestingly, if capacity was your kind of main requirement, you can actually run two of these together. The one controller and inverter can actually use a second battery to double its capacity. Of course, we're back in that situation of you needing to be very realistic in, in understanding how much power you're likely to be able to put back into the battery from those solar panels. So these are definitely very interesting products and this one seems absolutely brilliant it's powered everything i've thrown at it including our kettle which is theoretically way more power than it's capable of delivering but it still came to the boil and clicked off as expected so it's an it's an amazing thing obviously i have no problem charging laptops and and any kind of charge you put into it but it's also got a whole array of other inputs and outputs you can use it with a 12 volt car battery input or your mains input or the solar panel input so all of those three ways you can use to charge it and then you've got usb c and usb a outputs all of them really good powerful outputs outputs as well, as well as this high power 12 volt output you can use for jump starting car batteries. So it's a pretty versatile thing, especially in that kind of off grid or, or recreational environment. 
The main issue I can think of in terms of camping with one of these is obviously these are worth a lot of money. Just leaving it in a tent if you're not there would be a bit of a risky thing to do. And of course, the big solar panel on the outside of the tent is quite the advert that you've got one of these inside. So that's definitely something to consider in terms of where you might be going with one of these things. They are quite expensive things, of course, but this brand is an Amazon seller and they often have those Amazon discount vouchers on there that really bring the price down by quite a chunk. So it's definitely worth checking that out if you're interested in picking one of these things up. I've had this thing for a few months now and I've had it kicking around the house and we've used it for all kinds of things. The kids have been plugging their phones into it and all the rest of it. The interface works really well. All the buttons in the screen and the readout will work very well. I've had it charging from the solar panel in the garden as well. Um, and it all does exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, interestingly, there is quite a loud fan on it. So if you're using the AC sine wave inverter, you will have this fan. So don't expect it to be silent if you're kind of pulling any sort of power from the AC system on. It's also got a very bright light on the back of it that does a strobe and different brightnesses as well. So that's actually a really useful thing to have built into this. So definitely feels like a very high quality product. Obviously, time is going to tell how many charge cycles we actually get out of this. But the LFP battery charge cycle situation seems to be fairly well documented. I don't really expect any issues out of this. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one next, where I look at our car camping family camping setup using a bell tent. It's an unusual tent choice, but one that I think is absolutely brilliant for family car camping in many ways. And I'll see you then.